welcome to Just a Family. This is giving you something to talk about, or just a live TV, as I like to call it. I'm your host, Melissa Kretschler. I'm an identity coach, spiritual teacher, and business mentor, among many, many other things, but we're not going to get into that. Um, I will let you all know that I'm affectionately known as a crazy cat lady, and I will take that, I will take that to my grave. Um, I have six cats, and so this episode is definitely one that is near and dear to my heart. So we're going to get started. Our sponsor today is a Phoenix, uh, not a Phoenix identity, uh, the Butterfly Lotus Company is sponsoring today's episode. If you want to learn how to connect to your animals on a deeper level, maybe a more spiritual or energetic level, go and uh, book a discovery session with them and uh, learn how you can energetically and emotionally connect to your animals. Uh, so go and check that out. Today, we're going to be talking about the relationship between you and your animal. Um, and let's get into that. But before we do, I'm going to hand it over to Wendy to introduce herself. Wendy, would you like to say hello? I would. Thank you very much, Melissa. Hi, everyone. My name is Wendy Andrew, and I'm a pet bereavement counsellor and author. So um, the reason I'm here today is, is really to talk about the, the impact in that human companion animal bond. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people, we, we were talking about this in our pre-screening, a lot of people don't understand, like, when you actually have a pet and, and you're, and you connect with that pet on it, on that deeper level, and you build that companionship relationship, it is a very powerful relationship, it is a very impactful relationship. And not a lot of people know how to really um, express that or or explain that we talk about our pets being our children we talk about you know how you know in the spiritual community you're familiar or your soulmate or whatever that may look like and excuse me it's it's interesting just how impactful they can be in our everyday life yes a hundred percent I mean I I have a Pomeranian Chihuahua uh, called Pixie, Pixie the Palm Chi. Mm -hmm. And she is my best friend. She's my companion. She's my reason to get up and out in the morning. And uh, I, I can't begin to, to stress how much importance there should be given to that bond, especially um, when they cross the Rainbow Bridge. Yep. Um, so I've had many animals over the years, and I have one in particular. Um, my cat she's 14 um and this cat is i would call her my familiar my soulmate whatever you want to call it she is i call her a traitor right now because she's preferring my husband over me in the last like year um but I'm rude. <laughs> i know right <laughs> but she i love her and um the connection I have with her when I'm sad, she's there. When I'm unhappy, she's there. When I'm happy, she's there. It's, it's so it's, it's energetic. It's not even, it, it, it is hard to explain because it's, there's no words that can truly identify what that cat means to me. And that had how comforting I find her, um, her presence. And we were talking about so I'm going to go into a little bit of a story for anybody watching or catching the replay so we're going to talk about pet bereavement of course on this episode um and pet grief and why it's so like why it's so um as if you were losing like I said a loved one um I've had so I got a female Rottweiler um in 2010 and I named her Cleopatra and she was adorable. And I had a one-year-old daughter and a seven-year-old son. Um, and so I had her, we moved uh, across country and ended up getting a male um, named Caesar, of course, because Caesar and Cleopatra, they go together. And um, we had them. And, and when she was about two, we ended up breeding them. And we had bred them just the once. Um, and we had 11 puppies and we had grown very close. Uh, having those puppies was the, one of the, the most uh, amazing experiences of my entire life. Um, it was fantastic. I, I, I can never recreate that, that, that time frame in my life. And so anyway, when we, when the puppies were born, there were 11 of them and 
the runt of the litter, and I'm going to say runt of the litter, and she was by all accounts and purposes, the runt of the litter. She was the half the size of her siblings, but she wouldn't open her mouth to eat. And this went on for a few hours um, after they were born. And I, I finally turned to this puppy and I'm holding it. And I'm like, if you just eat, I will keep you. And within 20 minutes, she was eating. And I was like, oh my God, like this was like four to six hours after she was born that she finally started eating. And so I was just shocked and amazed. We ended up keeping her. Um, we went and of course we're in Canada. And at this point, you know, docking tails and that was common practice at that time um, because she was so much smaller than her siblings I chose not to have it done and we were planning on keeping her uh, so I chose not to have it done so she was right while I with the tail which was absolutely adorable um, and at by four months old four and a half months old I could take her out and she would walk beside me um, she would follow me throughout the house she would follow me anywhere that I went um, she was turning into a very amazingly well-behaved puppy um, for, for four and a half months old, uh, unless her sisters came over. <laughs> it was, then it was no go. Um, but during this time, um, my husband and my, my oldest, my son, had decided to go across country to visit family for Thanksgiving. And so it was just my youngest, or not my youngest, my first daughter and I uh, were at home with all the animals. And somebody had walked past my home uh, right before, uh, my family was leaving to go on this vacation. And I noticed somebody kind of walk up to the fence and then they kept walking. And again, we had two full grown, uh, adult big Rottweilers who were protective. They weren't aggressive, but they would bark whenever anybody would walk past the house. And then we had had issue with our neighbor. Our fences were the same fence. Um, and the fence was very old. We were renting and, um, my puppy had jumped on the fence or jumped at the fence and knocked over a panel. And this neighbor across the yard um, had two young sons and freaked out, called the police on me saying, oh, you know, your your dog is going to eat my kid and they're scaring them and just absolutely freaked out. And I said, it's a four month old puppy. Like, it's not going to hurt you. Uh, she just wants to play and she's being noisy. Right. Um, lo and behold, uh, the next day, my puppy got sick and over the weekend, uh, Monday, everything was closed and I was trying to hydrate her and keep her eating. Um, she rapidly, uh, declined and Tuesday morning, I took her into the vet. Um, they said, okay, we're going to do some diagnostic surgery, uh, and see if there's anything, you know, stuck in, in her system. And by the next morning she had passed away. And, um, so I found out after that, that somebody had actually poisoned her, um, her, all of her internal organs had turned gray and were shutting down by that point. So, um, she had passed away. I was devastated. Um, I kept her profile, her picture as my profile picture for almost three years because I just couldn't take it down. And it was one of the most devastating losses that I've had of an animal. Um, and I've always been more impacted by animal loss than I have by human. Um, and so that was a very traumatic experience. And I, I grieved for her. I couldn't talk about her. I couldn't think about her. I couldn't without absolutely breaking down. And 11 years later, um, I ended up having to put her mom down about two years ago. Uh, she had full body cancer. Uh, and that was a horrible experience. And then um, last December, this past December, I put my mail down. Now, my mail was the hugest Rottweiler I've ever seen, height-wise. He was big boy. <laughs> we, people either avoided us or wanted him as soon as, as, soon as they saw him. Um, but he was my protector. He was my companion. And he had separation anxiety. So from the day we took him home to the day that he passed away, he was never away from me. Um, we were always together. And his loss, I took really, really hard. And we had to, we chose to put him put him down. Um, he was older and having a lot of issues getting up and down. Um, but the loss was unimaginable with all of them. And you and I, Wendy, uh, sorry, I'm trying, not trying to monopolize this. These are my own, only stories for this episode. Um, 
we talked about the beginning of pet bereavement and how the loss impacts us, right? Um, but we also talked about the fact that there is um, a loss that you experience or a grief that you experience in preparation. And that's what I'm going through with my cat right now. Um, she's not sick. There's nothing wrong with her. Um, but she is up there in age and I already experienced the, what am I going to do? <laughs> what am I going to do moments? Yeah, that's anticipatory grief. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it's very common, Melissa. Um, so many people when their, their dogs reach a certain life point in life, or if their health is starting to decline, then it's natural to get that pang of, oh my goodness they're not going to live forever. And as pet parents, you know, guardians, caregivers, whatever we call ourselves, that is part of the deal. And we know this going into it, that unless you have a turtle, a tortoise, or, you know, an African yeah. gray parrot, you know, that most species are going to, to leave us heartbroken because they simply just don't live as long as we do. And it's devastating. I get pangs of anticipatory grief about Pixie and she's only eight years old and fit as a fiddle. So I completely understand that and it's normal. I just want to express that to people that it's normal. Whatever people feel is completely fine. It's neither right, neither wrong. There's no right or wrong way to grieve when the time comes. But with anticipatory grief, it sometimes gives us a bit of a heads up as to what's ahead you know what, what we can expect what emotions we're going to go through so in in a certain context it's beneficial actually to feel anticipatory grief because then you know how you're going to feel you're going to feel those moments of guilt when you're making the the end of life decision and care or you might have moments of guilt when oh I should have done this different I should have done that different and also it gives you the opportunity to say well okay this is a bit of a reality check let's make some fantastic memories let's take some amazing photographs and have experiences together in, in preparation for this event so that we have good things to reflect on and draw comfort from when the time comes. And that's actually exactly what I did uh, a few days or if not a few weeks before we we knew for a few months that we were going to make that decision um, and we wouldn't have made him wait too long um, in any pain or anything along those lines. There was no pain or it was just a lot of, you know, discomfort and, and old age. Um, but there gets to be a point, yeah, where like I was taking pictures and I was, you know, I would look at him and I would be like, oh, like. I'm going to miss this. Right. Um, and so you do, you definitely take those pictures, you take the videos, you reflect back. Um, and it's, I remember telling my husband, and, and this is one of the reasons why I wanted to do this episode is again, we don't necessarily understand that connection as much as we realize that that dog for me was my companion. He was, it didn't matter whether I was home alone in the house. I was never alone. I was never alone. I always had somebody there who was willing to protect me, to support me, to guide me if I needed. Um, and, and he was just there. Right. And a lot of the times with cats and dogs and, and other animals, we take advantage of the fact that they are just there. And maybe don't, we don't give them the attention that they crave. I know dogs are, are horrible wanting attention all the damn time. Uh, <laughs> Very needy. <laughs> me, that's one of the reasons I prefer cats is because they're like, leave me alone until I'm ready. Um, I think I was a cat in another lifetime. Um, but yeah, that's, that's why I prefer my cats. Like I love dogs, don't get me wrong. Um, but I prefer the cats because yeah, it's like, oh, uh, you want to pet me? Well, not right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you know when I'm ready. <laughs> yeah. um, so last night, my cat, the the one that I'm always, that I'm calling a traitor right now because she prefers my husband over me. Um, she, anytime my husband and I go to cuddle or give each other affection in the evenings, like during the day, it's fine. But in the evenings, if we, we cuddle or give each other affection or anything, 
she's right up in there. Like, <laughs> immediately, she will jump on the bed, climb over my husband, then climb over me, try to get in between us and the blankets. Like, she's just right in there, right? And I bet um, you get the butt end, don't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, lately, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And she used to be my cat. Like, she, she picked me, right? Like, we mutually picked each other. And it's interesting, having six cats, my cats do pick their people, right? Um, and they'll flip between all of them, but they do pick their people, right? Um, and again, there's that energetic connection where it's like, I, I got you, right? And you you just know. But again, going back to my dog, companion, safety, um, and, and unconditional love. And I think that's the main thing that people don't realize is that animals have absolute and utter, un they don't care what you look like. They don't care what you eat. They don't care how much you weigh. They don't care what your color hair is or your skin color. They don't care about any of that. They just care that you make sure that they're taken care of and that you give them love. Other than that, they want to please you. They want to, you know, have your attention. They want to be near you. They want to, it, it is truly unconditional love. They don't ask for a lot, do they? Mm -mm. No, and I, I think that's something that a lot of people really don't get. And, and that's another type of grief that's called disenfranchised grief. And that's when your grief is not supported or acknowledged in society, when people are quite dismissive of your emotions. And nobody has the right to tell you that what you're feeling is wrong. Your feelings are your feelings and nobody has that right. So, you know, if you feel grief, you should be able to express yourself and say, my pet, regardless of species, I know we've spoken predominantly about cats and dogs, but they are the, the main, you know, the most popular species. But, you know, companion animals come in all shapes and sizes, different species, different breeds. And, you know, it, your bond with your pet, whatever that pet may be, is strong and people need to respect that and acknowledge that and 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 give you a bit of a hall pass, you know, if, if you like, you know, if you're feeling like you need a time out socially or even from your work, then do that. Mm -hmm. You're not obliged to, you know, sort of show up for everything when you're grieving. It's, it's the same, you know, grief. And like you say, for, for some people, it can be stronger to grieve for their companion animals than for people, even family members, because the dynamics of those relationships are completely different. With humans, we have disagreements and fallings out and, you know, oh, that person annoyed me or this person wronged me in a particular way. So we can sometimes feel differently towards humans as we do with our companion animals, which you correctly said, it's unconditional love 24 seven. And for people to say, oh, it's just a cat, or will you get another dog, you know, or insert species is really dismissive. And, and it's not fair. It's not a very nice thing to do to somebody who's grieving. Because if somebody was recently widowed, you wouldn't say to them, oh, are you going to go on Tinder? You just wouldn't go there. Yep. So you you have to respect people and say, I know how I would feel or I have felt in the past. So I, I know how I was feeling. So if you want to grieve, grieve. If you want to cry, cry. If you want to talk about it, I'm here to listen. And I would really actively encourage people to be a bit more supportive. I know a lot of people are and most people's inner circles you know will have that person's back but in general in society there's there's a lot of people who are very dismissive of pet loss grief and and it's and it says a lot about a person if they can't just identify that somebody's in pain and hurting and let them sit with that emotion and be supportive to them you know I think that says a lot about them. You know, it doesn't matter what their opinion is about pet bereavement or pet loss grief. The point of the matter is somebody you care about is in pain. Yeah. And that comes to two other points that I'd love to make about, you know, that human pet relationship is 
a lot of the time. So when, when I put my dog down, um, I wasn't ready to get another one. Um, did I start looking right away? Absolutely. Because I'm crazy. And you know, that, that safety is really what kind of made me, but no matter who you are or what stage you're at, your grief is going to look different than everybody else's. So if you are needing that companionship, maybe you're needing it for your mental health. Maybe you are somebody who constantly wants to be giving an animal a loving, safe environment to live and, and, and to be. It doesn't matter how quickly that you get another animal. It's not a replacement. Um, and a lot of people will judge when others do that. Um, I had a lady, uh, a friend of mine on on social media, who uh, had put their dog down uh, quite re- quite recently, and uh, her and her husband decided to get another one. And it was a last minute decision. It wasn't a, um, you know, it wasn't something that they had been thinking about for a while of getting another one. And when they posted the new one, they said, "Don't come at me." And I commented, of course, and I said, nobody, you know, it is never too early or never too late. You, you know, it is never too soon. Um, You need to do what's best for you when you know, you know, and sometimes that animal will come back to you. Sometimes there is a moment where you see another animal and there's that instant connection, that soul connection that says, I need you. Right. And yeah, it's it's a it's a terrible thing that people feel that they have to grieve in a certain way or in a certain time scale. There's not a time limit on grief. It takes as long as it takes. And don't compare your grief journey to somebody else's because everybody has their own experience. If somebody says, oh, you're still upset about this. One of my friends lost their, you know budget regard and they 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 got another one within two weeks well that's great good for them but it's not like that for everybody everybody has to listen to their own heart and go at their own pace and you know there's there's no right or wrong there's no guidebook for it and I think it's very you know insensitive for people to to make those comparisons and I'm very saddened to hear that your friends actually said, don't come at me. You know, it's a shame that they actually felt that that needed saying. Well, and because that, it shouldn't, you know, that's because. That's a very common occurrence on social media, though, now. Um, a lot of the times people will post, don't come at me, don't, you know, I've even posted that. Um, I had somebody, I posted about my son. Um I posted on my son's birthday last year and I, him and I have a very interesting relationship where I, I will bug him. (laughs) I just, I bug him. He bugs me. It's just the way it goes. And I posted something and I was making a joke um, about him not being grateful or something. And it was, it was a joke. Right. And he would know what it means. And most of my friends, like my close friends were like, oh, that's just them. But somebody actually came on and started accusing me of shaming and guilting my son. And I'm like, whoa, (laughs) no, but that's the thing. A lot of people and, and when it comes to animals, whether it comes to, you know, you calling your pets children, whether it comes to, you know, the grief process of losing a pet or an animal companion, whatever you call that relationship, people will have a hard time not expressing their opinion not sharing their opinion of how you should be. And I remind everybody that when somebody has a comment, a compliment, a, um, what's the opposite of a compliment? Um, Criticism. uh, A criticism or anything along those lines, that has actually nothing to do with you. That has everything to do with their opinion, their beliefs, and their- And their experience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, And a lot of the time, we have a hard time not sharing that opinion um, because we feel everybody should have the same. Uh, It's it's a very human response these days. Here here in Scotland, in case your audience didn't pick up my accent, (laughs) Um, but here in Scotland, um, we we have a kind of fair saying that you don't always have to share your opinion, you know? And if you've not got anything nice to say, 
don't say anything at all. And, and it's a very sad time we live in on the internet where everybody thinks they're Arnold Schwarzenegger behind their keyboards, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they, like you say, they, they feel they have the right to say things to people that they wouldn't dream of saying in, in front of their faces. And I'm always an advocate for grieving pet parents because I know how that feels. I've been there myself. I mean, I, I set up my pet bereavement counselling service because of my dog walking clients. And then when I qualified, so many people said, oh, I wish that had been around when I lost my cat or my dog. And so that's why I decided to, to open it up to everybody everywhere and, and internationally as well. So hopefully I can break down some of those barriers um, and educate people about, you know, sort of brief etiquette, for want of a better phrase. Um, and and to, to let them know, you know, sometimes words do hurt. I know that's something that we all tell children, but we forget about that in adulthood. And, you know, if somebody is having a really hard time and they're suppressing their grief because they feel obliged to in society, one horrible word could be catastrophic for that person. So, I, you know, I, I always say, you know, who said that to you? Who's asked you I need to kick? <laughs> You know, because I will I will always come out and advocate for grieving pet parents. And I, I picked up on something that you said earlier, if I, if I could sort of men mention that, as well as something else to talk about, the, the docking of, of tails and ears. You know, that's very often a vital part of communication for dogs. They express themselves with their tails and their ears. So when part of those are missing, you lose part of the communication. You know, so sometimes, you know, these these dogs do look awfully frightening when you're talking about your, your Rottweilers. Very often people would cut their tails and cut their ears. And and with Dobermans as well and all, all different kinds of breeds. And it's no wonder that people misinterpret the dog's body language because they're losing half of what the dog's saying to them. And I think that you know, not, not shaming anybody who, who does that. This is not the time or place for that. But I think people would perhaps have more of a an understanding of people's bonds if they saw, you know, the dogs, you know, wagging its tail, looking up at its owner, and they could say, this pair really love each other, don't they? I'm obsessed with Pixie and everybody knows it. And I'll probably need counselling myself when, when she crosses the Rainbow Bridge. But... You know, people really need to acknowledge and understand the impact of their words and respect how people are feeling. Um, speaking of the docking of tails, uh, I we have a few people watching, so I want to say hello. Uh, somebody said hi, but I don't want to butcher their names. I'm not going to repeat it right now. Um, but one of the things with docking is when I got Rottweilers, I had young children and it is a very large breed. And I wanted to make sure that I trained it right. So I did a ton of research on training, on the um, uh, history. And so originally, Rottweilers had had their tails docked because they would pull meat carts and they would pull, um, what's it called? Uh, the medical beds in the very, very early times. They would carry the medical, medical beds on war fields and that. So having their tail in the way was actually removed um, so that they wouldn't get it caught or injured. Um, mm -hmm. Now, in this century, it is for looks, right? It's the predominant uh, Rottweiler staple. It's an aesthetic. It's, it, it no longer serves a purpose. Yeah. And it's basically at this point, whether you agree with it or not, um, like I said, at, uh, I've, I've done it. Um, would I do it again if we ever had more Rottweilers? No. Um, but I did at that point because that was what was expected. Um, Times the, change. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but again, it, it is body modification without consent, right? And I know that animals can't really consent, but again, um, it, it is it is something to consider. But um, pet bereavement, I, again, it's whether it's your whatever type of, of animal, there is that connection. It's building that relationship. An animal's behavior, an animal's companionship, their love, you can understand all of that, right? Um, 
And when you truly understand that connection between a human and an, and an animal, the training gets easier, the expectations get easier, um, and, and the entire life in general becomes a, a more positive experience when you understand the human-animal um, dynamic and, and what's expected and what's not expected, right? Um, but again, understanding that it is an animal, um, they are meant to be wild, and secondly, that they do have feelings, um, whether they have emotions and feelings, not uh, obviously like a human would, but similar, right? There's the fight or flight. There is the love. When you have a cat that's lying on your chest purring, um, obviously that cat is happy, safe, and content. Um, so it's, it's really just understanding those things and understanding that the relationship between an animal and a human can be so powerful and so impactful um, that the loss of that animal would be absolutely devastating. Yes. And, you know, at the at the other end of that sort of spectrum of love, you know, if your animal is scared, you know, if you're scared, they're there to protect you. And if they're scared, you immediately instinctively, without even thinking, you do something to console your animal. Pixie's terrified of thunder and fireworks, and I will do everything in my power to make sure she is protected from those feelings of fear. And quite often as well, particularly with children, when you have that human companion animal bond, that can be through a child's formative years. So, you know, that that's something quite, I'm, I'm always quite keen to you know, sort of work with families or even give give out free advice to families and things like that and top tips. And for myself, I, I went through pet bereavement as a child and that was my first experience of death. And that is very much the case for a lot of, of children and young people. You know, death, you know, is, is part of life and your family pet is often the, the, the first death that you encounter. So if I may, I'd like to share just a couple of do's and don'ts um, for your, your listeners and your viewers, if that's okay, just to, to let them know a little bit about how to, to support their children when the time comes. Okay, so the first thing I would like to say is don't use the phrase put to sleep. Because, and it's a very common phrase. Lots of people say, oh, I put my, my cat to sleep or put my dog to sleep. But for this, this can cause an awful lot of anxiety around sleep for children mm -hmm. because they then become afraid of sleep. They be going to sleep themselves or their siblings going to sleep or their parents or grandparents going to sleep. Well, they go to surgery. surgery. Any, any form of surgery for a loved one of a child and you say, oh, they're just going to put me to sleep. Wow. Yeah, that correlation would be quite, uh, quite damning. Yes, it's very damaging. Um, so, you know, choose your words carefully. I quite like Crossing the Rainbow Bridge, which was attributed to a lovely poem. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, it, and it's a softer way, you know, by all means, say the dog died or the cat died or the horse died. But do it in make your explanation in such a way that it's age appropriate and that's not going to you know scare the bejesus out of your child and don't blame the vet either because it's not the vet's fault very often people say things like oh we took the vet to the the, the dog to the vet and they couldn't fix it the child then becomes angry at the vet for not saving their their pet and it's that's not an emotion that you want a grieving child to feel is anger you know we want to try and avoid that and so it's better to say the dog's very sick or the dog was very old and the time came for them to cross the rainbow bridge um or they they were very unwell and they were so unwell that they couldn't get better so words like that that are a bit more truthful and a bit more direct and age appropriate and with children returning to school in the past year or so after lockdown, it's important that nursery um, teachers and you know school teachers, et cetera, it's helpful for them to be aware of what's happened. 
because very often grief comes out in behaviour with children and they can act up and get frustrated and lash out and things like that because they just simply don't have the same ability as adults to regulate their own emotions. So as I say, it very often comes out in behaviour. So it's better that the staff know what's going on so that they can be supportive to your child in the right way and you know, give them that support instead of them giving them into trouble and giving them a row for being naughty. Yeah, we and did also, when we put our dog down. We, good. Yes. And we said, you know, um, our children may be a little bit more upset uh, in the following days. We did just put our dog to, uh, we put our dog down um and and they're upset about this so obviously if that shows up in the next you know week or two uh please let us know and just give them a little bit of grace yeah I think that's absolutely perfect spot on um I would also say lead by example show your children it's okay to be upset and to grieve and then that way they, they know that they can express themselves. They have the right and the freedom to express how they're fe feeling. So if you're like, oh, no, I'm not upset about this. You know, the child's like, I shouldn't be crying about this. I'm not supposed to cry about that. And then that, you know, has the kind of ripple effect out into the, the greater world as they age, you know, that you shouldn't cry over your pets. Well, you should. Why shouldn't you? Um, and, and also in the in supporting them sometimes it can be difficult for them to express how they're feeling in, in words so sometimes if they draw a picture or if they write if they're if they're old enough to write and draw and things like that um kind of like a journal therapy almost um to to write down how they're feeling or to write a story about the pet or their favorite memory with their pet or an adventure these can all be quite nice things to get the conversation started so that you can say, well, that's a beautiful picture, darling. How, how were you feeling when you wrote that? And, you know, what, what emotions are you trying to tell me about with this picture? So these sorts of things can get the conversation going so that you know what's going on with your child. I'd like to expand on uh, something that you mentioned. So I am a emotional and mental health expert. And one of the things that I've noticed in society today, even with my own children growing up, most specifically my oldest, um, we haven't been necessarily teaching them to um, process their emotions, right? Their emotional health. And I find that e even for my own generation, I was talking to uh, one of my friends who's the same age as me at one point. Um, and I asked a question and they said, well, no, I don't want my children to see that. So it was, it was along the lines of, do you cry in front of your children or do they know that you're having issues or that you're stressed? And they said, no, I, I, they never see any of that. And so, um, if my husband and I are having a row, um, my kids, if they hear it, they understand, you know what I mean? But they also see us make up. They also see us talk through it. Right. So if, it's, if you've lost a pet or you're going through that grief process right i need to be strong for my kids because that's always comes up you're not actually teaching them how to process those emotions how to process their grief um and to know that you know it's okay to be upset it's okay to express that anger that sadness that you know denial or regret as long as you're not taking it out on other people but guaranteed it'll get taken out on other people when they don't know how to process it's like a volcanic eruption. Mm -hmm. It lies dormant for a while. They're on top of it. They're keeping it down. And then look at them. Look how many adults today struggle with their mental and emotional health because they don't know how to process their emotion. FYI, I do have methods that deal with that. <laughs> so go back and watch some episodes uh, or connect with me because I that's one of the main things that I teach everybody, individuals, couples, families, all of it. Um, you need to learn how to process those emotions. That's super important. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add before we get going? I know Nancy said some great advice, Wendy, and absolutely it was. Um, so do you have anything else that you'd like to add before we get going? Um, I would really just like to say to people that if they are struggling um, with their pet bereavement or their pet loss grief, um, don't be afraid to pick up the phone or send an email to a pet loss counsellor such as myself. I'd be happy to speak to anybody anywhere and support them through that time in their life. But 
by all means contact somebody else if you think I'm not the right fit for you but the support is there so don't feel isolated in your grief if your friends and your family don't understand there are other people professional people or, and there's lots of self-help books as well if you're not a therapy person you maybe prefer a book the support is there if you look for it so don't suffer in silence yeah. um one of the things that i'd like to reiterate is nobody can tell you what your relationship between your animal is um that is a very individualistic uh experience and journey between animal and human and nobody will understand uh, to the degree that you will or Wendy and I, because we've been through them. Um, but they're not going to be the same for everybody. And not every animal is the same with everybody. So um, just love your pets, uh, understand how to connect with them, to give them what a relationship between you and your animal should be and can be if you give it the right amount of attention. So um thank you so much Wendy for your time today thank you so much for having me and I'd just like one last wee quick thing to say it's not always about a death these feelings of grief can also come from a forced separation such as a relationship breakdown or the need to rehome your pet so if you're feeling grief from that as well that's perfectly normal and understandable and supports available for you too mm -hmm. absolutely all right, for anybody watching, if you want to connect with either myself or Wendy, please feel free to do so. Our links are in the description of this episode. You can find us there. Um, if you would like to be a guest speaker, sponsor, blogger, or if you want to see a topic featured on the show, please reach out to us at justalivetv.com. Um, at any point, like, follow, engage, give us some love. Um, we are always welcome to more ideas and more followers because, well, why not? Um, our sponsor today is the Butterfly Lotus Company. If you would like to connect with your animals on a more energetic or spiritual level, go and check them out, book a discovery call, um, and learn how you can build on that relationship. So go and check that out. Um, again, thank you all for watching uh, or listening, and I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon, morning, or evening.